Welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson. On this podcast, we talk about all things to increase muscle and performance, <clears throat> better body composition, and how to do all of it without destroying your health in the process. Today in the podcast, we have my friend, Dr. Brianna Stubbs, and we are taking a huge deep dive into the world of ketones and especially the different types of ketone supplements, both the salt and the ester form. If you are interested in this, you might be wondering why the heck would I use ketones? So one of the things that I believe ketones are useful for is the end result of a longer period of fasting. When you're fasting for longer periods of time, your insulin levels go down. Obviously, there's a bunch of other hormonal changes also. But low levels of insulin push the body to use more fat. And if you run a piston of fat through the liver, one of the byproducts is these ketone metabolites. The three of them are BHB, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetone, and also acetone. <clears throat> these three ketones can then be used in different portions by your body. And if you're really interested in this, I think that there is an argument for longer periods of fasting, but not done all that often and done within a very specific framework. So the framework that I use for that is the framework of physiologic flexibility. So pillar number three in that is fuel systems. So how can you further expand them out from the extreme high end which is going to be carbohydrate use and even carbohydrate loading, maybe the use of some other supplements to help with that. And on the other extreme end is longer periods of fasting or a higher key. To me, this is the extremes of metabolic flexibility. Can you go from a state of a lot of carbohydrates to a state of fasting or high levels of ketones? Those are going to be the polar opposite ends of the fuel spectral system. So physiologic flexibility has four main pillars. The first one is temperature changes. The second is pH changes. The third is changes in fuels. Four is gonna be oxygen and carbon dioxide. If you get better at all of those systems, I believe that offers true longevity benefits and just being more resilient, anti-fragile, and a lot harder to kill. The result of that is your recovery is going to be much better also. That is all discussed in the Physiologic Flexibility Certification, which opens again on March 20th, 2023. So check it out. Go to physiologicflexibility.com for all of the information there. And in the podcast, as I mentioned, Dr. Brianna Stubbs and I go really deep into ketones ketone esters, ketone salts, when should you use ketones? What are all the difference now between the ketones on the market? Shocker, if somebody says this is a ketone ester, it may not be the same as a different company's ketone ester. What are some of the potential uses for them, both for performance is where we talked about a little bit, and then we talk about concussion, TBI, traumatic brain injury, and some other potential uses also. So enjoy this podcast with Dr. Brianna Stubbs talking all about the use of ketones for performance and health and possibly a role in concussion and TBI. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah. Loving life here in California. Where in California are you? are you at now? I work at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging, which has been Marin. And I live in the East Bay. Oh, okay. Nice. How's California life? I would say that the weather is stellar and everything is great. But actually, recently, <laughs> we've had a lot of storms in California. So typically, the weather is great. But it's been a bit more like being at home in England, a little bit grayer, a little bit more rain the last couple of months. But oh. I can handle it. Most you grew up that way, right? It's dreary weather all the time, isn't it? Exactly. For at least six months of the year in the UK, it'd be gray and raining most days. Yeah. So, okay. I yeah. spent years and years ago, I spent two months in Ireland on an exchange mm -hmm. program. And the running joke was it was either rain 
or sun when we were there. And they're like, oh, this is beautiful weather. It's normally not quite this nice. We're like, I don't know. This isn't really that bad. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But so I moved when we first met, I was working with HVMN on their Keto Nesta product. And a year or so after we, we met in 20, it would have been 2019, I moved to the Buck Institute where I still do some commercial partnership work with a company called Juvenescence and they commercial com commercialize Keto Nesta products, but I also involved in the hands-on science Buck as well. So it's a nice hybrid role. And at the Buck Institute, you're looking at aging. What aspects of aging? Still focused on how ketone bodies might impact on the multiple like pathways of aging. We are interested in ketones because fasting, caloric restriction, ketogenic diet all have been shown to help multiple complexities of organism from simple things like yeast all the way up through to non-human primates. All those similar interventions have been shown to help with health span and lifespan more often than not. And one of the things that's common to all of those states is the production of ketones. And so really in the last, you know, within the time that I've been working in the space, so like last 10 to 15 years, the prevailing like dogma has shifted from ketones just being a fuel source that's useful for the brain in time of starvation to actually ketones being a signaling metabolite that may actually also be causing some of these other molecular effects that help with aging. And examples of that might be affecting oxidative stress. And that was the first documented non-energy role of signal of ketones. And that actually came out of my two mentors at the Buck, their lab. At that time, they were at the Gladstone Institute, but they found that ketone bodies could affect oxidative stress. And since then, people have found that ketones affect inflammation through the NRP3 and Jack chromosome, which is implicated in aging, and also post-translational modifications of proteins that affect markers of senescence and all kinds of things like that. So it's really expanded a lot in the last 10 years. And so my background came in with looking at ketone drinks for athletic performance. And now we're interested if ketone drinks can help with healthy aging. So it's definitely an interesting pivot to go from doing clinical research on elite cyclists and all of that. A lot of the same concepts actually apply. It's energy stress and the body's kind of in in the crisis of it work in extreme training, extreme environments. Like I know you're very familiar with that kind of thing. Well, the same kind of problems apply in healthy aging. Yeah. So if we back up and <clears throat> I guess tell the listeners about some of your early research in looking at ketones and I believe it was high level cyclists, correct? Yeah. So I was part of a research group that was based at the University of Oxford. The lab chief was Professor Kieran Clark and the PhD candidate, med MD PhD, who was running the project was Dr. Pete Cox. And they had actually been funded by the U.S. military as part of an, like a funding program that was called Metabolic Dominance to demonstrate that ketones could be made in a form that would be ingestible so that you wouldn't have to be on a ketogenic diet or fasting or doing any of these kind of low onset and quite, for some people, difficult to adhere to. And you're like kind of those kind of trying to get rid of the dietary intervention, but still be able to tap into ketone bodies. And so they developed this drinkable key source of ketones, a ketone, the first ketone ester. Now there are actually many such compounds and they were testing them actually first in rowers, which is actually how I even came to be in the project because the first you ever exercise high level study. Rower, right? Exactly. So I was at that time a junior international medalist, being on the under 23 British rowing team and eventually progressed through to being on the senior world championship team, winning the world championships so for Great Britain in rowing. But my involvement with the ketone project was just as I was transitioning up into the other 23 national team. And uh, they were looking for elite rowers to come and take these ketone drinks and row on their own machine with and in a blinded fashion, but with and without ketones. And that was the first time that I ever really heard about that biology outside of a biochemistry class, really got me interested. Um, and so subsequently did like a master's equivalent project with the lab and we did a lot of more work on cyclists because it's just there's a much bigger pool of athletes to recruit if you do cycling and we actually had a lot of rowers come and ride on the bike and that kind of thing so it's just very like fit people we did a lot of studies looking at performance but also metabolism as well and learn how to do 
muscle biopsies and all these other kind of sexy things that you do in clinical research. But that was the first paper, or I was involved in that first published paper, which came out in 2016 in the journal Cell Metabolism. And that was really foundational for people. A lot of people have gone on to look at if ketones taken pre-exercise could be beneficial for athletic performance. What is your your thoughts on that? As a side note, I did a very informal experiment with the, through the Kerrig Institute, through the Human Performance Program, where I think I had contacted you about this, where we use the old HVMN ester, and I had students for three days. So we had them do, these were relatively fit people. They weren't elite level athletes, but we got access to a bunch of concept two rowers for non-rowing people. And we had them do it under a fasted condition with the HVMN ketone esters, and then also had them do a, a carb load. And what we found, again, we just did this, I think two or three times, it's not published, unpublished data, is we had a couple people hit a PR on the fasted state. We had most people hit a PR on the carbohydrate state. We didn't have anyone hit a PR on the ketones, although we yeah. did some very crude cognitive tasks. We did like a Stroop test and a few other things. And it was interesting with the ketones. We did see some trends for RPE was a little bit lower. So rate of perceived exertion, cognition immediately post was a little bit better. Yeah, Performance-wise, didn't really see a huge increase. Yeah. It's been such an interesting ride to watch this space evolve since that 2016 paper, because at the time that was published, only the Oxford group had access to that. Yeah. Group. And the paradigm that was set up and tested there was that the athletes were taking ketones with carbohydrate, but on the on a fasted background. So like when I did my rowing machine test, I would turn up at the lab like mid morning, having not had breakfast, but then we would get your like carb and ketone mix. So it was this weird kind of not really what you would normally do as an athlete, but also not completely carb depleted. And so subsequently, subsequent groups that tried to replicate the work often use ketones on a background of a good carb rich meal and then a little bit like you just described ketones or ketones and carbohydrate and it's not there's not been a consistent beneficial effect of ketones taken before performance so i think we're now at about 20 studies not all of them on the monoester but a number of studies and honestly it's pretty inconvincing not unconvincing like inconsistent not convincing then you do, actually, let's just stay on the science before I move to like anecdotally, like what people have done. There's still a lot of interest in whether ketones taken post-exercise could be beneficial for recovery. That's an area that is pretty threadbare in terms of the research. But in terms of pre-exercise on the background of otherwise like optimal nutrition, it seems like ketones don't consistently improve endurance performance. And not many people have looked at sprint performance, but you wouldn't expect necessarily to see that improve physically so yeah i mean it's it was a very striking result that we got in the oxford study i i believe that result that we got but i actually also believe that the conditions of the pre-test conditions weren't really replicating what's being done in the field it may be that under for specific types of exercise or now people are looking at giving ketones with say bicarbonate to buffer the acid load of ketones and there's been one of, one of the positive studies found a beneficial effect of ketones on performance there. It is possible that we mess around with dosing, mess around with giving it a different timing, or but it's not really, I couldn't tell you a gold standard protocol that is going to work for as many people enough of the, as much of the time as they like caffeine does, right? It's just like one of those things where it's not, it's definitely not plug and play yet. So I'm interested in it. And I think that then there may be settings where it works for people and maybe individuals who respond better, but it's not. When we only had that one study, the mechanism also was very compelling. We, we felt that we were providing high levels of ketones for an extra oxidative substrate for exercise and obviously providing fuel during exercise is a big possible way to improve performance. We were seeing decreases in blood lactate, which we also thought might be improving performance. And that, that kind of thing has been seen consistently in other studies. And we also saw decreased use of muscle glycogen. And so all of that kind of together, the performance impact along with all of the nice biochemistry and metabolism that, that we saw made sense and was quite compelling. 
but then again, not all of that has been replicated in the subsequent studies. So one, one group in Belgium led by Peter Hestel has done a number of studies that followed on from the Oxford study. And on the background of regular carb feeding, ketones plus carbs, they didn't really see a change in muscle glycogen. So I think that perhaps what we saw was because again, of like people coming in and otherwise fasted apart from that pre-carb load. It's a shame that didn't replicate, it reduces like the confidence in that as a mechanism. And then the other big hypothesis was that ketones were being used as a fuel and actually out of the Oxford group itself. And another, I think another group looked at this as well, but they labeled user heavy isotopes, stable isotope to label the ketones and actually measure how much of it was being burnt. And it was under one gram. Uh, it was, uh, gosh, it was really under one gram per hour. It was very like compared with carbs, which is like 60 grams per hour. It was like very small, the amount of fuel that was coming from ketones. So it wasn't even that compelling that ketones were providing like a major oxidative fuel to skeletal muscle. And what, one of the hypotheses has always been that you really needed to get ketone levels up to provide a lot of fuel to then be used. And this oh, study that came out was really nice actually, because it looked at three different dose levels of ketones and it looked at the amount that was burnt. And, part, and it also looked at three different intensity. David Dearlove, who did his PhD in the same lab as me, authored the study. And there wasn't past a certain, past like a moderate intensity and past a medium dose. There wasn't any additional ketones burnt if you exercised harder or if you gave ketones. So it was, for me, it wasn't really like the final nail in the coffin, but it certainly reduced my confidence that ketones were an important fuel in ex during exercise when carb stores were kind of replete. So it's been, yeah, it's been an interesting ride because early on I'd have been probably one of the strongest advocates for these as like a performance tool and now it's not super compelling. It's one of those things about science. You have to be able to be prepared to revise your opinion based on new data. But to then sidestep from the science, like I've been involved with companies selling these products and people come back and people buy them, buy more and people say that they do PRs and that they, they're, I know that the companies that still make these products have customers from the world tour cycling and i'm sure that they're measuring performance in their athletes so may maybe there's something going on that hasn't come out in the end of 10 studies in a lab setting but i like to I try to stick to published data yeah and i believe team sky was using them for tour de france and for high level cyclists and then when i talked to someone from that group they said that it was more potentially to reduce the risk of head trauma. If there was an mm -hmm. accident, they thought having ketones on board may potentially reduce that risk. And it wasn't necessarily for performance. And other people said, no, it is for performance. And other people said, mm -hmm. no, it's only for certain phases of the race. And that yeah. was, I never got a clear answer on that either. And maybe it's just because they don't want to tell everyone what they're doing or. If you take 10 steps back and look at things from a really high level, it's still quite an early stage of like technology development for this. Oh, um, sure. But, so I think that all of everything that you just said could still be true if we investigated it. There's yeah. a really good, like I said, there's still potentially some performance settings where, you know, whether it's if it's for specific individuals or in specific, as you said, phase of the race, like maybe ketones do impact performance. Less confident on that, but still a possibility. Head injury is a really interesting area that's being looked into a lot, especially by the military. A lot of interest in providing exogenous ketones as a quick way to potentially mitigate concussive injury and again, recovery as well. It's there's a lot more research that's needed. A lot of these things have plausible mechanisms and there's a lot of ongoing interest in work across like multiple domains, physical function, cognitive function cognitive function, neuroprotection, and then the aging and health span stuff that I'm working on now. Yeah, it's, it's too early to write anything off just yet. I think it's the best place to be with this right now is to have a healthy interest and an open mind and wait to see if the more studies are done. Definitely no definitive answers yet. Yeah. If we look at just the hypothesis that it's providing a fuel source for maximal exercise and increasing performance, I believe ketones energetically are still below carbohydrates but above fat if we just look at the biochemistry yeah. of it is that correct and would you agree with it and then would we expect them from a pure fuel standpoint to be equivalent to carbohydrates which probably gets into the follow-up questions about signaling and other things they might be doing 
We can get into the weeds really quickly with that question. There are so many different ways to rank or compare like how right. things are being used as fuel. The the one that listeners may have heard of, like ketones being 28% or 20 something percent more efficient than carbs. That's a figure that comes from an isolated heart perfusion, rat heart perfusion. So like a really not physiologic um, setup. But the metric that they were comparing there is a really um, complicated concept, which is the free energy of hydrolysis of ATP metabolism. So that's like, how much potential energy even get captured and stored in the resulting ATP when something is oxidized in the mitochondria. So that that's one thing you could compare. And let's just say based on that paper that ketones are, are producing more potential energy stored in ATP. But then you've got like the carbon for carbon, like free enthalpy of the molecules. And that's like another chemical way which kind of considers how much energy is stored in all the different carbon bonds in a molecule. And then you've got the per oxygen used how much energy is released. And so I've done this as a paper exercise before. If you plot out these three or four different metrics, yeah, sometimes carbs are above ketones, sometimes ketones are above carbs. Fat per molecule has tons and tons of energy stored in it, but right. it's not really very efficient. But that doesn't mean it's actually a super important fuel for most of us at rest and during like low to moderate intensity exercise. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to think about this. When ketones are present, they can't, there's not right a ready metabolic pathway for them to be stored. So they're always going to be used preferentially to carbohydrate, but that doesn't mean that they're completely replacing carbohydrate. They're just being oxidized as well. Yeah, it's there's not really a clear cut answer to that. If you have carbs present, they're still going to be being burnt at a really high rate. But having a ketone drink actually can like lower your blood glucose and like actually mess around with the availability of carbohydrates as well. It's hard to say whether that's because of the direct effects of ketones inside the mitochondria kind of being preferred fuel versus just like changing the overall availability in the blood because of the glucose effects. Yeah. Sorry, that was deep and nerdy. No, that's good because I was on a panel at ISSN years ago when some of the ketone esters first showed up and it was right after the cell paper, I think, came out. And one of my concerns was if they're being marketed to general population who is not an athlete, who is not burning through piss tons of calories at once, what sort of happens if you consume these ketone esters? We'll stay, we'll stick with those for now in a background of high carbohydrates, but paradoxically, maybe lower metabolic health and maybe higher blood glucose. Because if you look at nature, for example, as listeners know, most of the time you're going to see high levels of ketones it is a long period of fasting, maybe a starvation condition. Generally, your insulin levels are going to be relatively low, where in this yeah. case, you could theorize that insulin could be high, glucose could be high, and you could have ketones also be high at the same time. Yeah, that's an interesting point. The, and I'll tell you the way that I think about it right now and like the data that supports that. This is just my like working hypothesis. And so... There have been studies done that last about a month, which is quite long in the grand scheme of like clinical research of ketones in people, healthy people, but also people with prediabetes. And it tends to be that we've seen actually in an acute setting and in those longer studies that ketones taken in the presence of a big carbohydrate bolus actually blunts glucose response. I think that it seems to me like at least for those 28 days that have been studied, if you're pouring in those extra carbons and calories and fuel sources, ketones, the body is able to adjust by decreasing the availability of carbs in the glucose and carbs in the blood. It also decreases the concentration of free fatty acids in the blood as well, which is going to have impacts on tissue insulin sensitivity and may actually um, potentially be beneficial for metabolic health in the if used in the long term. But I think that there isn't, I'm not concerned about energy overload because when we see ketones go up, it tends to be that glucose acutely goes down, even in the presence of a glucose bolus. And there's a really neat series of studies that came out of John Little's lab in British Columbia. And he took the ser three, three, four papers and they did healthy people with an oral glucose tolerance test and ketones pre-diabetics with an oral glucose tolerance test with and without ketones, and then healthy people with and without a carb-rich mixed meal, so like much more real world than the glucose tolerance test. And across all of those studies, 
they saw that in the ketone condition, that postprandial glucose was blunted. So showing again that if you've got your glucose is here and then you put ketones in, the glucose is going to go down to compensate and keep your kind of energy balance in the blood fixed or similar. So it's not going to be energy overload. And then the little group as well have done these studies that go out to 14 days with continuous glucose monitoring and shown that effect on postprandial glucose continues for two weeks that they have the subjects in the study. The way I look at it, the way I think that it's working at the moment is if you've got energy level X in the blood and you pour ketones in on top, glucose is going to go down. Also, fatty acids are going to go down. So energy in the le level in the blood level in the blood is going to stay fixed-ish. So it doesn't look like we have people running around with very high glucose and very high ketones and very high free fatty acids and just like saturating the body with substrate because it looks like the ketones themselves or have regulatory effects that maintain a homeostasis and that level of blood energy. But I'd be really important to extend the work that's already been done in like a frankly diabetic population to check that. And obviously longer studies are better as well, longer than the two weeks and 28 days that have been done. But it's that's where the work where the data is right now. Looks like it could be beneficial. The 28 day study came out of the University of Oxford and they looked at HbA1c and another marker of glucose chemical stasis and a couple other things in these. Were they pre-diabetic or type? They may have even been type 2 diabetic. And things tended to be a little better metabolically in the diabetic group that took ketones. Looks okay. <clears throat> Low to moderate confidence. Yeah. More work needed. And is that because ketones are having an effect on the liver? So the liver, in, in simple terms, is being like, Oh, we've got ketones. Oh, don't put in any more glucose. Oh, don't put yeah. any more fats. We've plenty of fuel here. We're fine. Yep. Like just cut down production of those things. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. So I think that because when I've given in my like practical experience, giving people ketones, the ones who seem to have the biggest drop in glucose is people who are already like reliant on hepatic glucose output for their mm. level. So if someone is like overnight fasted or someone... Yeah is on a ketogenic diet, those people can have really huge ass drops in glucose that take their glucose into a level where they should be like feeling hypoglycemic and they'll be feeling fine. But it's a pants biggest impact because it's really, I think that a key site of action is like the liver and gluconeogenesis. And there's been some really nice work trying to tease that out that showed that alanine, which is a key gluconeogenic substrate, alanine concentrations go down in the presence of ketones with the ketone drinks. So limiting, we've got alanine going down, we have lower free fatty acids and those are hydrolyzing and glycerol is also a key gluconeogenic, probably partially by restricting gluconeogenic substrate supply, we're getting a decrease in hepatic glucose output. And that has also been looked at with IV ketone infusions and traces, showing again that the hepatic output is important, but it's probably not the whole story. And there's probably some chain, possibly, probably also some contributions from say peripheral tissue glucose uptake in the short term anyway, because one study that was in athletes post-exercise, they were really depleted exercise and then gave ketone drinks and infused a hyperglycemic plant, so really stuffing glucose into the body, but maintaining it. Might get the concentration wrong, but I want to say they maintained it like 10 millimol or very high. And the infusion rate needed on the ketone condition to maintain that blood glucose was higher. And then the subsequent muscle glycogen store was also higher in the ketone condition. So possibly you're also getting some increased uptake in the periphery. But yeah, it's, it's happening either end there. You've got probably decreased liver output, probably some increased tissue uptake. And that's combining to give you the lower glucose. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I talked to Dom D'Agostino and asked him the same question a couple of years ago, and that was his general response. General response to you. so it's I, I'm glad I'm, I'm not deviating too much from what Dom. Yeah, and I'm always fascinated by one of my favorite quotes is from Peter Lemon. He's like, "Just because it's logical doesn't mean it's physiological." So we could sit around Seriously. and like the argument I gave you could view as, "Well, oh, that sounds logical. It's based on known mechanisms." Yeah. And no, nope, probably not true at all. Like yeah. You can come up with what you think is a logical thing the body would do, but that doesn't in any way, shape, or form guarantee that's actually what happens. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And that really, that completely applies to everything we just talked about in the first 20 minutes about like sport performance, because yeah. it was so logical. Like we had this really clear hypothesis, this really clear mechanism and a result that supported it. 
And in the end, like other studies that have gotten more into replicating and more into the details haven't borne that out. So yeah, it's just because it's logical does not mean that it's physiological and it highlights the importance of replication in, in science. This is something actually I want to say because I feel like I should say it on a podcast. I hate it when people make big claims based on one study because you've got to look yeah. at science as like <laughs> a wall and you've got to build bricks in that wall. And now with the experience that I've had, think now if I came out with one study with a positive outcome, it's fine to be positive about that, but you've got to heavily caveat that really it needs replication across multiple different population groups and independent labs under different, you really, if you cherry pick data, but cherry picking is different again, which is where you might, where companies that market ego nesters now continue to say that they improve performance mm -hmm. based on one or two of those studies, not on the totality of the evidence, the 21 studies. And that really grates with me as well. Yeah. It's, science is about building, building bricks over time. And you can't just focus on the one like, positive study that you get because that's not the totality of the evidence. Yeah. And the longer you've been doing stuff, you realize that, man, homeostasis ruins everything. It's like you come up with all these great theories and, oh, this is going to be amazing. Sport performance, right? Look at how many, I think we've tried and, and tested almost, what, every intermediate at this point. Like listeners yeah. who've been around, like creatine is probably the best one. Yeah. Maybe beta alanine through intramuscular yeah. carnosine, some buffering agents, but maybe some nitrate. Like all the other yeah. ones, nitrates, maybe from a blood flow. But even then, <clears throat> creatine has pretty good data on it. Beta alanine has some good data, but not all of it replicates. You probably got to be in the yeah. 120 to 240 second range of exercise. Outside of that, it gets even more sketchy. Yeah. yeah. Baking soda, bicarbonate, yeah. it can, but. You also may shit your pants at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's always catches, caffeine. Yeah. But even then in the Again, best case the scenario, most... yeah, you're looking at yeah. <laughs> single digit percentages, right? I, I think <laughs> that having been an athlete, and you must see this having been a coach, right? There's nothing that gets away from the basics of good trading, dumb nope. consistency, injury prevention, general nutrition, proper sleep. Don't do those things. Why are you spending $40 on a ketone drink? Yeah. I just, yeah. Yeah. It's I feel a, like it's... I, I live in this world of getting excited about new things and hoping maybe this is like the next creatine or whatever, but also having this great discordance or cognitive dissidence, knowing that 99.5% of the things are just probably not going to be pan out yeah. either but you're always kind of looking for that next thing it's i totally agree with you and i like i think that we should be curious and optimistic because yes. i think it's sad if you're your skepticism is fine but i'm trying to think of the word if you're down on everything and yeah. you're or you know it's dead before you've even looked at it then you know we're never going to make any progress so curiosity and interest and a little bit of optimism, but not over optimism. You've got to test things out, put them through their paces, have an open mind. That's fine. I think that now we're talking about it, it's interesting to see, interesting, the nutritional interventions that you just laid out and that in the context of specifically with say running, the super shoes and the tech improvements in, in running have been probably like moved the needle more than anything nutritional in the last five, 10 years. It's just, yeah, it's really to put everything in perspective of how much it's actually going to get you. And honestly, it's been refreshing to focus some of my research more on health than professional sport, where in order for those interventions to have a benefit, everything else has to be so optimized. I think when you're thinking more about health, you accept that you're going to be in an already not optimized condition and people are looking for things that, because adherence to anything, it's so difficult. You're trying to get people to start an exercise regime or trying to get people to stay on a diet. So in those instances, having as many tools as you can that are translatable could help to move the needle for people because people's health is crummy now in, in the Western world. And it's going to cause us a lot of problems down the line if we don't fix it. Yeah. And last part on performance will transition is I think people forget, and myself included, just, man, how long and how slow science is, especially for performance, because there's 
some funding limitations. Not every researcher is looking at performance. It's definitely its own sub niche. Even with carbohydrates, right? I wrote an article years ago about carbohydrate loading. Like the first <laughs> mention of it I could find was like 1897, where they would give their athletes bread before a big event was the first sort of published yeah. thing I could find. Well, the, we've had a Bergstrom needle now for what, 60 plus years to do biopsies and to look directly at like how much substrate is there. And if you pulled top level coaches, I would say there's probably still not a hundred percent agreement on how much should you carb load an athlete? What should you do? There's definitely a lot of yeah. best practices and we know a lot more now than we used to, but it's not like we have all of the answers. And yeah. back to basic stuff, like even with some athletes, they're like, oh, so you want me to carb load before I do a 2K row? I'm like, yep. Oh, but this is so boring. I'm like, yep. And then one guy we did an experiment where I think we took him from 200 grams of carbs to 450, just like one or two days before. Nothing crazy. Yeah. Didn't even prolong. And I th think his max wattage went up by 50 or 60 watts. And we did it like back and forth. And again, he might yeah. be a hyper responder, who knows, but that's from carbohydrates. That's not from yeah. anything crazy. And he wasn't on a low yeah. carb diet, so it's back to basic stuff. Yeah, it's really interesting. And even in this one now, when I talk about ketones and performance and give the story and the mechanisms and where we started and where we are now, I do actually highlight when carb drinks started to become a thing in the six, I think it was the sixties with Gatorade, where you know, what we know, 50, 60 years after that yeah. now. And we still have companies innovating on top of the carbohydrate platform, some with different levels of success. Because I think, again, there's, it's really interesting. You have companies like Morten, so the company that's doing peptin alginate carbohydrate, it like, it's a drink, you drink it in gels, it's meant to be so release. And everyone was super excited about that for 18 months or two years. They had loads of really high profile athlete ambassadors. And then now the research is like slowly catching up. And I read a meta-analysis recently where I was like, yeah, does only improve performance over and above standards. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. yeah, and yet another thing bites the dust. As you were saying, you've got to watch everything with quite a bit of skepticism until it's been tested a, a few times. No matter how fancy the marketing is and how many high-profile athletes say they're using it. Yeah, I think of the examples of, I don't have any disclosures on this program, so I can say whatever the hell I want. But with the super starch or the waxy maize preps that are supposed to be this oh, super, yeah. <laughs> super slow carb release. Yeah. And you look at the data and you like scratch your head and go, if it is that slow of release, how the hell is it doing anything? And yeah, then you've yeah, got yeah. pectins like the Targo that are a much faster release. And even in the carbohydrate space, there's not a hundred percent agreement on the type of carbohydrate and GI yep. upset, how much fluid yep. and blah, 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 yep. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I saw a paper recently that did 120 grams an hour, which is a double the normal, Ooh, like normal yes. 60 grams an hour. You're like, okay, we're going to keep on trying. But as an athlete, you just figure out what works for you and you try different things. And maybe some athletes can tolerate that really high carb intakes. So maybe some athletes really feel great on ketones and maybe some athletes really don't like caffeine. And I think one thing that also I feel more and more the longer that I'm in the field is that you as an individual can try out things on yourself. And if you're data driven, then you can get a sense of if it's working for you. But also, especially as a female athlete, actually, so few sports science studies done in female athletes, or even in the mixed population, we have to, everyone, has, you can't generalize super far from studies all the time. Because, you know, there's a difference between your 20 to 25 year old, moderately fit college males who are in this research subjects are probably like 80% of sports studies. And then even that's being applied to women or men in their forties and fifties who are like recreationally active. So like, why are we making gold standards recommendations that are adopted by everyone based on very constrained populations? So I think that it's not surprising, like you and I. We dress differently. We need to wear different clothes. And so we, we also probably need different nutrition because you do different things to me. And I'm a woman, you're a, like all of those things mean that we have differences. And so personalized nutrition strategies for health and performance are something that I think there's a lot of nuance missing in the conversation because everyone's always, oh, it's a ketogenic. Should I go on a ketogenic diet? And I'm like, <clears throat> let's, let's unpack that because maybe in very few situations, yeah, like maybe it'd be the right thing for you to try. But if you're 
in these other situations and maybe it's not the right thing for you. Is it like good or bad? And I was like, oh, well, the answer is it depends. And it's the same with carbs and keto nesters and all of the caffeine and all of it. So yeah, lots of nuance missing in the conversation. Yeah, my favorite, excuse me, phrase, I don't know if I stole it from my buddy Sean Casey, is research points the way me search gives you the answer, right? Because yeah, no, most, like most people as an individual athlete, they don't give a shit about the research. They want to know what works for me. And as practitioners and researchers, you have to read the research because you got to know what area you're dealing with and you can get more of a educated starting point. But that doesn't mean that average, which is compiled from research and whatever people, males, females, training status, blah, blah, blah. It's just a starting point to iterate from because like carbohydrates per hour, I think it's what's recommended with 60 grams per hour is like the average. Yeah. And then I think it was Jack and Drope said that that's trainable. You could easily get people up to 80 grams per hour. Yeah. I think it wasn't Kipchoge when he tried to do the breaking 200 or breaking two hour marathon was at like 90, 120 maybe, or something like yeah. that per Crazy. hour. What maybe he trained his way up. Maybe he's just the guy's obviously an outlying freak anyway, and he's trained very yeah. hard. Maybe that's just something else that makes him run faster too. I don't know. But you've got almost a twofold difference between the average and like the elite of the elite in yeah. back to carbohydrates again, something that's rather basic. Yes, exactly. Yeah, always more to learn. So I make a far fewer definitive statements than I might have done at the start of my career. Yeah, yeah. As we transition more into to health, can you just run down the kids? Because there's a lot of exogenous ketones on the market. Some are not on the market anymore. Like. How would you classify the types and if you generalize them between the esters and then also we've got the salt variations of them as, sure. as supplemental form? Yeah, the like most basic way you can supplement ketones is having fat-based products. So like medium chain triglycerides that will like slightly elevate your ketones. Those tend to be the least efficacious in terms of blood ketone levels and have a relatively high GI side effects risk. That's the kind of thing that people are putting in, like following a ketogenic diet, doing bulletproof coffee with fat, and medium chain like triglycerides. That's like most basic, least efficacious, the most broadly available. Like when you can get that kind of supplement, most places. Then we have ketone salt. So they were one of the very first things to be commercialized. And it's you just have the main ketone body that's in the blood, beta hydroxybutyrate in an ionic form with a mineral like sodium, potassium, calcium. Uh, those products are evolving. So the very first load that came out were what's called a racemic mix of the two optical isoforms of beta-hydroxybutyrate. You think of this like left-handed and right-handed forms. So like structurally the same, but don't overlay on one another. Yeah. And only the right-handed form is used in the body. We don't know much about what the left-handed form does. Again, initially, back when I started researching this field, we thought that it didn't do anything. And now people are finding that this left-handed form may actually have some of the signaling effects. So we, like, maybe it's doing more than we think it is, but quite not unknown about that. And so when we were giving people salts and measuring their blood ketones, we're only measuring the right-handed form. And so ketone levels are pretty low in comparison with other products that we'd studied. And people haven't consistently seen performance benefits with that kind of product. So it's better than medium chain triglycerides, but still not super efficacious. And there's been, I don't know how much of this is like accurate, but some people express concern about possibility of impact of long-term and mineral consumption. So if you're really like tripling your daily sodium consumption, if you don't, if you're not changing your diet to take it out from somewhere else, you run a risk of mineral overload, could affect your blood pressure, it could affect kidney health otherwise so that's never these products have been distributed for years and as far as i know no one's dead so it's maybe more of just like a concern and worry than a real thing but that's a consideration and i also found that when we studied those when you were using like higher doses of salts they could also cause gi issues a little bit like bicarb right if you load the like yeah. mineral <laughs> into the gut you just your gut's like and yeah so and it I had feels to have, horrible too it just yeah. doesn't feel good I actually had my sister come and be a research subject for this study where I was studying the high dose of salt and she never came back and did any of my studies again. She took the high dose of salt. She was, yeah, really glued to the toilet for a few hours. Yeah, that's why you don't need to tell me about research. So that's a salt bucket. 
Now companies have started to develop forms that are just the right-handed form. So the measurable amount in the blood is actually higher with those products. You still don't get around the mineral problem. It's, but that's like an evolution on the first round of products. Not all products are purely this right-handed form. And sometimes more often than not, the companies obscure like actually what's in the products, not super sure whether it's the physiologic form or a mixture of the two. So, so there's a big category of products based on ketone salts. And then there's a bucket of ketone esters. And it used to be that there was only really one or two that were talked about. And now we're at least three, actually four. Not so, and they don't all behave the same. So I think at the very start of describing this category, I have to say, just because something is a ketone ester, it doesn't mean that it's all, they're all going to behave the same. These ketone esters tend to be made up of ketones or ketone pre precursors that are esterified to one another. A common like backbone to these molecules is an alcohol called 1,3-butane diol. And that's actually itself, that 1,3-butane diol is now also being commercialized by a number of companies as a way to elevate ketones. We can talk more about that in a minute as well. But ketone esters get around the mineral problem. They deliver the ketones and ketone precursors into the blood in a sort of a more, it seems to be more consistently potent way. So across the different ketone ester supplements, they tend to generate higher levels of ketones in the blood than the salt. I'm just going to get rid of these. Can you hear me again? Oh, we can hear you. Uh, nope, can't hear you now. Oh, now you can. No, we can. So, so let's talk about let's talk about three examples. One is the Oxford ketone ester. It's called a BHB monoester. This is the one that we just spent most of the first half of the whole class discussing in terms of performance. It is so a monoester means there's one ester bond. And it beta hydroxybutyrate, the main ketone body that circulates in the blood, is sterified to that alcohol that I just mentioned, 1 3 butane dial. And so it's a really simple molecule. It gets cleaved in half, and the BH beta hydroxybutyrate is released directly into the blood. And the butane dial undergoes a couple of conversion steps, like via normal alcohol metabolism pathways in the liver. And then that ends up as beta hydroxybutyrate as well. This is the most widely studied ketone ester. It's been used in sport performance studies glucose metabolism studies, studies of diabetes, and some neurocognitive studies as well, with quite a lot of interesting results across a lot of these different benefit areas. So that's, I guess, the gold standard with ketone esters and science stands right now. That's commercially available and being sold by a company, T Delta S. Ketone Aid also specializes that as well. Next up, we have a diester, so two ester bonds, acetoacetate and butane diol. So it has two parts acetoacetate both are sterified to a central butane dial molecule. One thing I should say is that ester bonds are really like generic. We consume a lot of foods with esters, so there's nothing really special for the body to break up these molecules. The acetoacetate diester was developed by Dom D'Agostino's group at USF. As far as I know, it's periodically been commercially available, but not really very widely distributed. I know a company called Keto Logic was making it and selling it in soft gel caps. That kind of disappeared, didn't it? Yeah. It was on Amazon and then not on Amazon. It doesn't seem to have a stable supply chain. I know that, and I don't know whether they still are, but they were running clinical studies, Angleman's disease. So i like, interested to see whether some data comes out of that or whether they make further efforts to commercialize it. Then I'm going to be running a study using some of that ester shortly, so hopefully hmm. data on it. So that molecule is going to deliver not BHB, but a lot of acetoacetate. And that's the second most common ketone body is in the blood when we make our own ketones. And BHB and acetoacetate are in equilibrium with one another. So when you deliver the acetoacetate, some of it's going to end up as BHB, but they're kind of going to interchange between the two. Without wanting to go too far like down, like too much of a rabbit hole, the conversion is redox link. And so hmm. as to my one way or another, you're going to be having different physiologic effects on the body. So delivering a ton of BHB, like with the monoester, which you don't need to deliver as BHB, versus delivering a ton of acetoacetate with that diester could potentially have quite different effects on the body via both redox, but also one of the leading researchers in ketones and signaling is called Peter Crawford. And he's done a study showing that acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate differentially affects 
per se, just an immune cell function. I su- suspect that in the, you know, the next 10, 15 years, sometime, we will end up dosing with or choosing different keto esters or different keto nutritional strategies according to a specific target called product profiles, specific desired, where in some cases the seed state might be more beneficial. And actually, interestingly, another, another example of this is, I can't remember whether he published this data, but you should talk to Don Dastina on this. He used the seed state ester in his seizure model, and it was very profound, suppressing oxygen-induced seizures, and the BHB model ester did not. And he suspects that's because of redox and again, you know, how those different ketones are being metabolized. So not all species of ketones are equal. And then... I think that's why he went down, if I remember correctly from talking to him, down that route, looking more at that ester type because they were looking at oxygen toxicity and some of the other stuff too. So I think that's why they patented and went more down that route. Well, it makes sense. I think that it, it makes a lot of sense to me Delivering BHB is going to be different to delivering acetoacetate. Yeah. Be useful. One could be more useful for, say, physical performance. One may be more useful for neuroprotection. And we know that the ketogenic diet helps control seizures. And people yep. suspect that's actually more due to the acetoacetate and acetone, those ketone species, than it is with beta hydroxybutyrate. It's still like at the hypothesis kind of stage. I wouldn't be surprised if we end up with different ketone strategies for different therapeutics. So those are two examples, one mainly delivering BHB, one mainly delivering LC to acetate. And then there's ones in the middle, which I've been working on for the last couple of years, which is butane diol again, diester of fatty acids. So a bit like the MCT oil, except supercharged and juice and much more effective at increasing blood ketones than a matched amount of MCT. But in this case, because you're not delivering the ketones directly, because you're delivering the acid precursors to ketones, you're actually triggering ketogenesis or leading to ketogenesis in the liver. And that's very distinct to those other two ketone esters, because those two just directly deliver ketones into the blood. But in this fatty acid, with this fatty acid ester, it gets hydrolyzed. You dump a load of fatty acid onto the liver, medium chain, so it arrives quite quickly. And then then the substrate beta-oxidation produces a load of acetyl-CoA. That acetyl-CoA is used for oxidation, but also for ketogenesis when it's being poured in at a high enough rate. And so with that, we see, this is interesting. So we only ever really measured BHB with this compound, but I'm very interested to measure acetoacetate. Mm. It should well. be higher, right? It should be higher than the mono. It should be intermediate between those. Right. You know. So it should be more like the physiologic ketosis that you get when you produce them yourself because you're producing them in a physiologic ratio. And so I guess to culminate like section, well, actually you should just briefly talk about butane diol. So now companies that have taken all of the other precursors off, just commercializing the butane diol. And so there's no like traditional ketone precursors like fats and no ketones, no BHB or acetoacetate. You just deliver this alcohol and it does raise BHB, but it's not known how, it's a lot, few, many, a lot fewer studies on that. We don't really know even the kinetics of it in terms of blood ketones. So it's, it's a bit of an unknown one to see right now. But that's, so the C6 ester is being commercialized by a company that's in partnership with the buck called Juvenescence. The butane dial is being commercialized by HGMN and by Ketone Aid as well. So those are like the main companies playing in the space. So my big research question, but it's part of a collaboration that's funded by the military and going to be run in collaboration with actually Buck is collaborating with Ohio State at the prime awardee on this military contract. And so what we are going to do is take all of these different compounds that we just discussed, actually not the salts, but the BHB monoester, our middle of the ground, C6 fatty acid ketone ester, our various cetoacetate-based ester from Dom's group, and then also butane diol. And we're going to study those side by side. We're going to measure everything. So we're going to measure not just the BHB, we're going to be using very a cutting edge mass spec, and taking very careful care of ourselves to actually get at seed velocity as well. And the mm. seed velocity is really unstable, very difficult to measure. And that's why it's not reported in almost every study of ketone science. It's really the ugly system. <laughs> but it's a huge part of the picture that's just missed because it's technically difficult. BHB, seed velocity. One other thing that we think could vary is pH. So we know mm. that pH responses 
we know that the BHB monoester results in metabolic acidosis. And that's actually thought to be some of the reason why it does some of the things that it does in some of the hypoxia experiments where it's been studied. So it's interesting. We'll see if that, whether there, whether there's a generic, generic effect of uh, physiologic changes that occur with ketones or whether some ketone esters or some ketone supplements do different things. And ultimately, because at the moment, all the companies that make these, they all just talk about raising ketones, and that's about as far as it gets. But for the military and for athlete practitioners and for those of us thinking about health or neurocognitive health or any specific outcome, we actually need to know whether there's a differential kind of fingerprints of each of these compounds. So we're going to do it, do the study at two dose levels, which I think is really important as well to see if there's a dose response and compare across yeah, all of the ketone measures, a bunch of strong iron, acid base balance, some respiratory gas analysis as well. It's just very detailed resting characterization of the physiologic effect of these different compounds. Hopefully once that works complete, I'll be able to tell you a bit more about whether these are all like, yeah, all ketone analysis is just the same. You take one. <laughs> It's the same with all of them, or whether I could give you more specific recommendations about which to use. Oh, that's awesome. I'm super excited to see what the end results of a study is because it's looking at the research as an outsider. It's hard because there isn't a lot of direct comparisons. It's like this lab did this, and we found this, and this lab did this, and the subjects, and we did this in the rat model, and we did this in the mice, and we did this in humans. And so you're (laughs) <laughs> well, loads of, especially the animal papers gloss over what compound they use there is a number of yeah that was fascinating to me it's, hey what did you do it's they like, use a salt did they use yeah it? then it's used to make generalized statements about like ketones as a whole it's really interesting actually with butane dial because there was one research group that used butane dial and if you read their papers in time order they start off by talking about it as, oh we use butane dial to raise ketone levels and as you go through the papers they actually started doing butane dial in a different ketone study, and they were finding butane dial did some things that the other ketones did not. And they actually then ended up testing butane dial's effect on vasorelaxation and vasoconstriction. And they found that butane dial specifically, not BHB, was having some of these effects on the blood vessels. Hmm. They'd been using butane dial all the way through a general conclusions about like ketone effects when actually it was it itself was having a fast that they haven't really accounted for. Yeah. You've probably seen this if you follow the diet and nutrition space, especially in like animal studies. It's like, try a fat diet does this to rodents. Yeah. And yeah. then people are like, oh, that means that the ketogenic diet in humans yeah. is bad. And actually it's a high fat diet for rodents. Still has it took more to more Western diet, still has quite a lot of carbohydrate. And get a rodent in ketosis, they have to basically no carbohydrate and if you haven't verified that they're in ketosis then you can't really extrapolate a high fat diet conclusions with ketogenic diet and you see this all the time it's the same ketones yeah i at this point i I was just did this yesterday i was looking and whenever i see something that says high fat diet and rodents i don't even read them anymore to be honest i just just skip right over it because i'm just like this is going to be a trash bin fire most of the time (laughs) And even just, I got so bad watching, there was a a researcher called Emily Goldberg and she was doing some research on the ketogenic diet and someone went in and really tore her to pieces for not protein chewing. And there's so many like nuances. It's all, if you haven't held protein constant, does that affect the ability to make this or that conclusion? And you're like, yeah, there's a lot of like nuances and designing diets for rodent studies yeah and our good friend tommy wood loves reading animal research he's such a huge fan of it i'm totally kidding <laughs> yeah. he's on another podcast or he does animal research on ferrets and other animals and oh, he's like you know, he and i actually yeah. put together he's doing the statistics for me so I'm not i know he's awesome but he's uh, like 80 90 percent of animal research that how it's done is just trash and he actually does animal research, so <laughs> lots of towels, so he can go away, go ahead on for any of those things. Yeah, so he's the I, he can say that I get in trouble if I say that. <laughs> well, I just threw him under the bus. The one three butane dial, like I got an early sample of that years ago from a guy in the supplement industry who will remain nameless. It was freaky because I had talked to him, and he's like, "Hey, you want to try a new supplement?" I'm idiot me. I'm like, "Sure," and so he's like, "I'm like, what is it?" He's like, "I can't tell you." I tell you it's grass certified, so generally regarded as safe. It's non-hormonal. Give me your address. I'm like, okay. And I had 
talked to this guy off and on for five years, never met him in person. And I get this little vial of a liquid in the mail and he puts in this good grips, like measuring glue measuring thing that he picked up at Home Depot in there. And that's it. No return address, no COA, like no nothing. Yeah. And I'm standing over in my kitchen sink. And all I remember him telling me was, was, and for God's sake, when you take it, don't throw it up because it's really, really expensive. And so I like left it and debated for a while and eventually tried it. And it, oh God, it no smell, but it did not taste good at all. It was just horrific. Yeah. And then later I find out that's actually what it was. But all that to say, like my buddy Ryan Baxter has done a couple of measurements recently looking at BHB levels with it. Do you think it will raise BHB as high as some of the other esters or because it has to be converted and what you're starting with as a base material? Yeah. Maybe it's more variable from one person to the next or yeah. who knows? Yeah, there's a lot of unknown. Something that's grated with me a little bit is that it's being marketed as an improvement on the acid technology when actually yeah. like it's like it's not. It's I like, thought it was a step backwards. Yeah, almost. it's like we've gone from V1 back to zero, 0.5. So like it's cheaper because you don't have to do like the esterification process. Yeah, it's way cheaper. People are saying it tastes better. I don't agree. I think it still tastes. No, they all taste horrible. It still tastes bad enough that I don't want to have it in my mouth. Um, no, no. <laughs> don't like it. doesn't taste that much better. It is cheaper. It, I've piloted it myself. It can raise ketone levels. It seems to be like a little shorter thing than the esters. You probably, because of the taste and the whether or not it makes you feel drunk is something that I've heard debated. So I've heard yeah. some people, and I've taken a couple of bigger doses of it myself and been like a bit like, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> there's only two published papers right now both of them for people feeling like intoxication like symptoms but i really don't want to get too far out like over the tips of my skis because maybe it should just be used at lower doses and forms that are being commercialized now with the pure r butane dial may be different to the rs so it may be again this individual variation and i think this is really important to say and i know that the company is selling the butane dial phase as well it itself is half of the monoester, a third of the C6 fatty acid ester, a third of the acetoacetate ester. So it is in all of these other esters. So if it is, it can't be, it can't be that bad because it's if you take 25 grams of the BHB monoester, you're taking 12.5 grams of butane dial or one ester. Right. It's unclear. It's unclear. I don't know. I think that I think it's probably a little over sim simpl simplistic to just be like. It's going to behave the same. 25, if you think that you've got 25 grams of butane dial, 25 grams of BHB monoester, I think that the increased flux through the alcohol metabolism pathway, we've measured it with the fatty acid ester. And in animals with the BHB monoester, you do get plasma circulating levels of the butane, the alcohol itself, butane dial. Other pe other researchers in the 90s found that butane dial is very like, permeable into the CNS and does cause CNS effects. Maybe doubling the amount is going to increase the amount that you see in the blood, and maybe that is going to be having some effects. As I mentioned, there are some specific and beneficial maybe effects of butane dial on the vasculature. It's this stage. There's a lot of very definitive statements being made with people with like skin in the game. I know that there's kinetics data pending on the butane dial. I'd be really interested to see that. And I know that there's some performance data pending on the butane dial, so I'll be interested to see that. But at this stage, when we go back, if we go back to my like bricks in a analogy, that's still only going to be like four published papers on this compound. There's every respect that it's not just the same as taking the HB because of the alcohol metabolism component, whether that's because of a liver effect or whether that's because of release the butane dial into the circulation and then effects of the butane dial systemically or even centrally in the brain. But that would be my, that's where I sit right now. I'm perfectly ready to like decamp and move to a different position. <laughs> Change it. yeah. It's just, I don't, know. I don't know how I'd feel about taking like 50 grams of butane dial a day versus something else. Really. Yeah, because I find it interesting that you've got one company marketing it as towards IQ cognitive and then you've got another company marketing as a alternative to alcohol 
Those and I'm like, true, right? So. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Because I looked at this again the other day and I'm scratching my head going, is this a different isomer? Is it a different dose? It appears same. to be very similar, I think. Same. Yeah, it's the same. Definitely some truth has got to come out there, not from the companies, but from people using it in research, I think. So, yeah, couldn't say. Hard to say. I think yeah. that the most important thing that we need, first of all, is the BHB data. Because at the moment, it can't, we can't even say for sure like how it works on ketone levels compared with other things and then we need more like tolerance data at the end of the day it is as you said it is grass is generally recognized as safe so i'm not super concerned about safety there yeah to- i'm not super worried about safety just more it's, it seems like it's being marketed for like completely different effects which yeah. boggles the mind and the day Everyone just all those guys just want to sell and make money. They the thing that I see that generally annoys me about the whole space, including the salt space, is a lot of people co-opt and cherry pick the one or two positive studies that are not even done with their supplement, and they co-opt those into product positionings. It's something that when I've worked with companies since since moving on from the first role, the way that we now look at evidence is much more of a totality based thing, and you don't make definitive statements about the product unless you can look at all of the literature and have a file that back that up. So just different ways. The thing is, as you supplement industry, not super well regulated, food industry, not super well regulated. And so people are gonna say things until they get told off. But this is a really interesting the Butane Dial is a really interesting case because of the way that it tiptoes around the do you need to be twenty one to buy it? Yeah. Because you know, I wonder if it I wonder if it'd ever be a big enough fish to get the attention of someone who's a regulator because it's definitely interesting because it walks that line if you're gonna yeah. say there's a buzz yeah and the we'll just say the guy who sells the hard ketones is quite a interesting fellow i will leave it at that <laughs> and the whole supplement space is filled with interesting fellows and probably that is not going to change anytime soon <laughs> that's why for me I enjoyed, I think I was in, in industry, pure industry for three years and it was, I learned a ton and I think that it's important for scientists to know like how to translate ideas because, you know, scientists kind of get stuck up in an ivory tower and you don't know how to, like what goes on in the real world that brings science to the masses. And so it was really helpful and really enjoyable and I learned a lot, but it just grates when you can't answer the questions yourself because of some, it kind of conflicts with the business interest or there isn't, or just isn't budget for it. It's nice to now be in a role where I can advise companies and provide scientific support, but also just ask like interesting science questions as part of my big day job as well. Yeah. And remind me, what was the very first ketone ester HVMN had? Was that a mono ester also? And so Oxford University, NIH developed the mono ester. And right. The company that like held the IP at Oxford was called TDAPRA. They initially licensed it to HVMN and I moved from doing my PhD at Oxford under the CEO of TDAPRA, who was the professor, moved and helped HVMN launch it. And so first product, HVMN ketone, which looked like this, was monoester. And then I left HVMN, their license agreement between TDAPRA and HVMN finished and t uh, launched their own version, which looks like this. And so this is t S. This is the original company that the Oxford pro- professor was running. And she went and launched it herself. And HVMN lost the rights to make it. And so for a period of time, they didn't have an offering. And then I think actually this one that I have, they called it Keto 2.0 to start with. I have all the bottles and everything. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, for, I should wave the juvenescence one around just so that I've shown Yeah. It. And actually, oh, do I, have, I think I have some Keto aid as well here, just to be... So yeah, so then HVMN called it 2.0 and now they call it Ketone IQ. That's just like butane dial, which as we said, is not really a 2.0 or more of a 0.5 in terms of, in terms of technology. I guess they would say like it being cheaper and it tasting better mm. does effectively make it an improvement. But yeah. Yeah. Not, like, not here to like. I'll... Yeah. I didn't realize they had removed it because I got a call from We'll say a couple months ago from a good buddy of mine who's a neurologist from a certain NFL player who got a concussion 
And so they're asking me all these questions and stuff. And I was like, oh, here's your options. And I went to their website and I'm like, oh, it's not there anymore. Really? It co-ops a lot of the brand building and studies that were done on the Esther, including when I was there, we secured investment from the military to study the Esther. All of that money was given to study the Esther. And that credibility is being leveraged to sell the beauty dial, I can mm. agree, which I don't really agree with. Yeah, I will tend to agree with that. Related to concussion, so I've asked this to Tommy, I've asked this to Dom and other people. I have this crazy thing where if I'm in kiteboarding and I get dropped out of the sky 20 feet in the air, generally wear a helmet. There's a risk of that or car accident or hopefully I stay away from trees snowboarding. But... One of the things I do is I carry a ketone ester with me. My thought being I would consume the ester after this, again, just me talking. This is not medical advice. After I potentially maybe have a concussion on the way to my neurologist, who is a good buddy of mine, who I actually have on speed dial, which is nice, I would consume the ketone ester, put myself in a state of ketosis, and I would transition to a ketogenic diet. Based on the research, do you think that's a good idea, a bad idea? Who knows? Might basically, be helpful. Dumb um, idea. The truth is, who knows? But based, based on the clinical evidence, I'd say it's a good, or I'd say it's a, a best good and it's worse null, net neutral thing to do. There's a, a quite a lot of compelling evidence in animals with different concussion models that being in ketosis, either at the time of the impact or post impact as well, can reduce infarct size, reduce brain swelling, rescue brain ATP. Now, you know this as well as I do, like, very hard to measure concussion humans. Yeah. Can't administer them in a research setting. Yeah. Come into my lab. You get a concussion, you don't, and we're yeah. going to see what happens. <laughs> like, that doesn't happen. It happens in the real world. They all happen with different impact at different parts of the head. There's different like timelines. It's just it's a really hard problem to get at. Very important problem because it happens in the playground all the way through to the workplace, all the way through yeah. to university. So like, it's a huge problem that I have a really big interest in, but I not I have no idea how to tackle it. But I think that the like, the mechanism for both energy provision, reduction of oxidative stress and inflammation, and actually increasing blood flow in the brain as well, like all the things that we know that ketones do in a preclinical setting, and many of which we see transferring into a clinical setting. We know from studies in people with cognitive impairment that the brain avidly uses ketones, even in the presence of suppressed glucose metabolism. So even a brain that isn't able to use glucose can still use ketones. We've seen that ketone, that the ketone ester can increase blood ketone levels and affect the way that the brain is functioning look at it with an fMRI scanner and so I think that if something like that happened to me or a family member of mine I would also tell them to do that but it how we get to having clinical evidence it's a like a hard path to map but I don't think you can't see a downside unless unless you wanted to argue that glucose is a really important substrate for the brain and so if you're limiting glucose then it's potentially worrisome if so long as you're providing ketones as the salt is the alternative i think that it should be a good strategy i know that there's a, i think that i was involved in a funding application that wanted to look at this in a clinical section in a clinical setting and i'm not sure whether that was going ahead or not but hopefully it is because that's really what yeah that was that's kind of my thought is we have a pretty good idea of what the potential downsides are. I don't think there's a safety issue as far as I'm aware or anything like that. Do we know what the real potential upside is? It's unknown, but we've got some early data, some preclinical data, some mechanistic stuff that says, eh, seems like a good idea. But One thing that I'm surprised it's taken me this long to say on this podcast is that a huge unanswered question across performance choice of ketone supplements and also in like a clinical application like TBI is like what level of blood ketones do you need to be yep that was my next question that's, that's like holy grail for this field defining that 
probably different for different outcomes, probably. So yeah, I mean, to go back to our like choice of supplement question, if the threshold of TBI is actually only 0.5, I mean, it doesn't matter if you use salt or yeah. whatever, like it doesn't really matter, you just use anything. But if it's actually two millimoles, then yeah, you need to take something that's going to get you higher and dose it in a way that's going to keep you there for some time. Unless, because, you know, the second question after dose level or BHB concentration, the second question is amount of time. Is it something where you just have to kiss it for 30 minutes and then you hit some signaling pathway and you get a benefit? Or do we actually have to sustain ketone levels above a certain threshold for time? So yeah, these are really big and important questions. And I'm a little concerned that, that studies may have null results because we haven't got that dialed in. Because actually, we've also been assuming generally that higher is better. And that's the marketing position that the monoester took to start with. We are superior to salt because we deliver a higher beta hydroxybutyrate with the monoester than is possible with MCTs or salts or with anything else. But to go back to the paper I told you about, it showed that plus a certain dose more of it wasn't even being oxidized. So it really blew that idea that higher is better out of water. So, you know, now the more like trendy way to talk about it is that there's a Goldilocks. So in the middle, it's neither too high or too low. But that's, again, just like speculation, not super. We need good like dose response studies. We need to find an end PD, a pharmacodynamic endpoint that reliably changes and then look at it across like multiple doses and see whether we know that for some things we have started to do that with heart function. There's been infusion studies that have done step rate infusions and showed that the higher that the HB gets, the more the cardiac changes. Mm. So that's one example where it's okay. Yes, higher is better in the short term for cardiac. Maybe we need to do the same for brain blood flow or some of the brain functional connectivity measures that have been done with one isolated dose level. A lot of speculation about that as well. Yeah. And so right now I just have the old HVMN, the first ester, but I'm running lower. So I'll probably need to replace it again coming up. Yeah. You should try like the C6 fatty acid ester. It's like maybe like a different kind of bad taste. It can't be any worse than that original one. The original one with no flavoring, that was horrendous. And I know when I had people take it, the, the, we used to take videos of their face. They're like, oh, they looked like they all got poisoned. <laughs> and I know that I've uh, been. There are partners at Juvenescence Essence are doing an awful lot of work on taste and flavor. So like hopefully there'll be more stuff that I can share about that sometime in the next few months. Because that's at the end of the day, everyone that's playing in this space, whether they're like whether they're right or not, believes that this is like quite a powerful metabolic intervention. Nobody quite knows like how to get there. But we are seeing consistently with almost all these supplements is that like you can give them and within 30 minutes you're in this quite unusual state of said ketosis. And because of like spotty clinical literature and a lot of preclinical literature, we're like, this is interesting. We're all just like trying to figure out what it's good for and make products that actually are useful in the field. Because I argue that whilst you've got something that costs thirty dollars per serving and tastes like gasoline, it's neat, but it's not. It's just not translatable. And really, with the butane dial, I'd argue that's still not fully fit. It's, che it's cheaper but it still doesn't taste good. And so what we need is something that is comparable to like another other supplements in terms of cost per serving, efficacious in terms of delivering our unknown BHB threshold, but doing, some, doing something in the blood and tastes good enough that anyone that I could go and give it to someone on the street without the crime. Because like right now, every time I give someone a ketone, I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's going to be like top five worst things you've ever tasted in your life. And, you, and if you tell people that, normally they'll drink it and they'll be like, well, that's bad. That's really bad, but thanks for warning me. But if I had gave someone like the Juvenessence product, they call it chocolate nitro. And you look at it, you're like, mm, chocolate milkshake. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> and if you don't tell people what to expect, people's, people are just like, are you trying to poison me? So you need something like somebody in space needs to get to a point where you can hand over a bottle, watch someone drink it, and they don't change their face. So until we do that, all of this interesting science just isn't relevant. So that's yeah. why it needs good industry partners because we can, even if I found out tomorrow that ketones 
were great for concussion, it would still be a really hard sell if it tastes like it did. And yeah, and it's one of those things when you taste, you, I hate to use the word chemically, but it has a very chemically, extremely astringent, like almost like this, I think I might have poisoned myself. It doesn't have anything you can relate it to other than something that's really bad. I think people will compare it to things that I'm sure that they've never actually tasted. They're like, it tastes like nail polish remover. And like, you can yeah, drink. you've drank nail polish remover? <laughs> or it tastes like paint stripper or some other things that like you just, yeah. you never drunk that categorically. Otherwise you wouldn't be here, but yeah, it's gasoline. Yeah, they don't taste good right now. And that's a big barrier to patient. Yeah. And interest in full disclosure, I do have a program through the Kerrig Institute that talks about the use of ketogenic diets and supplements for TBI and yeah. and the data. And the main reason I did it is was hoping different neurology, clinical neurologists would at least publish some case reports as a start to be like, hey, because one of the issues with doing therapy right away is your brain just has inflammation. It's got a low energy. Like you can't even sometimes do a lot of work per se with it so hopefully this would be an alternative that, that might be helpful for them to start doing therapy sooner too i would love to discuss that with them and anyone on your program that that's doing that kind of thing we at the buck institute we're using a mouse model but we're looking at ketones and delirium which is acute confusional state in older people and it's a huge problem clinically and I think that naturally a lot of similarities where it's like acute brain metabolic crisis and inflammation, not through physical injury, but just the lack of resilience capacity that, that they have. It's an area that's being attacked from multiple factors, whether it's TBI or delirium. Hopefully someone will get something that translates to the clinic soon. I think it's, it just makes so much mechanistic sense. that I really, I'm still working on this field and I hope I can continue to work on this field for a number of years. I really think there's going to be like a blockbuster or maybe even two blockbuster like use cases for ketone. These yeah. really powerful interventions. Like it's going to, it's going to work really well for something. I'm just really excited to see what that is. Yeah. If I were a betting person, I would bet on TBI if I were to bet. And again, that's, that's a guess at this point, but if there was anything related, that's probably where I would put my money. I'm with you. I'm with you. That would be in, in my top, like in my top three. And one of my other top three would be heart failure because there's, mm, so, there's yes. really good clinical evidence coming out now with ketones of heart failure, like we're going into heart failure patients and seeing these consistent changes in function. And so whether it's, so I'm not quite sure whether it's going to be like myocardial infarction and like heart attack in an acute setting or whether it's going to be like long-term heart failure patients. But I think, I think, and it makes sense. It's just makes so much sense if we think about the like evolutionary function of ketones. But at this like fuel to keep our essential organs like our brain and our heart going during salvation. So it makes sense they're gonna be it's gonna be good for those systems. But yeah, that those two I think are really promising areas. I just think TBI, I don't know enough about it, but it just seems so difficult to study and measure good biomarkers. Not good consensus on whether you should use eye tracking or cognitive cognitive testing or how you even start to ask that question. Yeah. And that's hard because as you mentioned every Every concussion is a little bit different. Like you're going to affect different parts of the brain. And even, yeah, we've got generalized areas of this part of the brain does this function, this part does that function, but it doesn't on an individual level, doesn't always map that directly either. So you've got a little bit of variety of how your brain's going to wire up from one person to the next. Yeah. But it's important, as we said as well, like lots and lots of people get concussions. And so, yeah, to go back to your original point, it's pretty low risk, potentially big upside, like. It's not medical advice and not medical doctor, but it seems to me like a sensible thing to consider. Yeah, I'm sure you've read the research on heart failure, looking at the loss of metabolic flexibility and cardiac tissue. So you just become more picky with what fuels you can use. Where a heart that's very metabolically flexible, it'll it can pull lactate directly. I think it can even pull pyruvate, ketones, fats, like pretty much any fuel source. It's gimme, gimme. I'll use it. But then as you get more disease like certain fuel sources start dropping off and you get pushed more one direction than the other direction. And that causes a whole host of other issues then. That's what, and it's another reason why I think that ketones are interesting because if you have a typical small molecule like therapeutic, it's going to be really specific to one pathway mechanism by, actually, by intent, by design. Right. 
it's going to bind to a specific transcription factor or a specific ion channel or a specific targeted effect. Is where ketones have multiple states and multiple binding partners. They're not, not only are they an energy, an energetic fuel source for cells and body, but they're also scavenging oxygen, reactive oxygen species, modulating inflammation, modulating gene expression that relates also to like oxidative stress. And it's just, it's because it's a physiologic response to stress, it makes sense that it's having this collage of effects across the body. Like, it's really, it's the, almost the opposite to a small molecule approach where it's going to be like having a gentle cut across multiple pathways and the net effect of that could be beneficial. Cool. Thank you so much for all your time. And we'll probably have to have you back on at some point to talk about your actual research and aging. I picked your brain the whole time about ketones. Well, my research and aging relates to ketones and like using them as an intervention. And it's been a really fun evolution to go from like performance science to aging science and the Buck Institute's doing those are really cool stuff and I'm learning a lot and be happy day to day working around like other like brilliant minds and that kind of thing but yeah this was a really fun conversation I don't think I said anything too embarrassing no we have to try harder to yeah. do more embarrassing stuff next time you can tell us some good rowing stories or something oh yeah there are plenty plenty of those yeah but this is great and hopefully we'll talk again soon yeah and if people wanted to find or if you maybe don't want to be found, how would they find you? Or maybe I just want to stay hidden in the lab. I'm on Twitter, Brianna Stubbs, and I share when I have publications and when I see things I'm interested in. A lot of some like content of my like, one year old Labrador and um, you know, athletic endeavors and stuff like that. So it's, I'm not, for a little bit of time, I tried to do social media and now I just gently partake. It's not a super big focus for me. I think it's a big energy drain nowadays to be too on social media. So. I'm there. People can reach me if they have any questions and I do my best to reply, but don't expect a lot of curated content. And I'm not on any, I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm not on any of the other like Instagram. I haven't made on TikTok yet or anything like that. So Twitter's where to find me if people want to contact me. And that's the best place to stay up to date with the research that we're doing. Cool. Thank you again so much for all your time. And I appreciate you sharing your knowledge. I think it was super helpful for people to learn all about the ketones and especially the different supplements because with all the hype and everything around it, it gets extremely confusing, like really fast. And, you know, that's not going to stop anytime soon. And so at least I know you went pretty hardcore into the molecular weeds, but just you know, people got, oh, there is differences between them. They're not all the same. Okay. Then I think that's probably a win. That other thing to take away. And once we have more information, we'll know a bit more about what the differences are. That doesn't mean that the company sell them are going to tell you what the differences are. That's the thing that kind of sucks in this space because, you know, a consumer has to be able to listen to the conversation that we've just had and follow it along to make a decision, an educated decision, because you shouldn't have to have a PhD in metabolism. Yes. <laughs> to be able to get product, right? Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done in this space to demystify it for consumers in that little, like 30 seconds or 20 seconds that you actually get to explain it to them. And I think the space as a whole needs to get more science so that we can check with more clarity if these things are different it's a fun space to be in it's growing really fast and i think this potential for impact will accept the warts and the, the flaws that it has right now and hope to see it mature and develop an impact yeah awesome thank you so much really appreciate it yeah have a great afternoon thank you Thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Huge thanks to Dr. Brianna Stubbs for being on the podcast. She mentioned off air that this was her first podcast in, I think, over a year and a half or two years. So I really appreciate all of her time and knowledge over the years and also just real world experience, both in industry and academia, and then also looking at them and in, in what is a useful framework too? So I originally chatted with her years ago and she's definitely one of my go-to people in the role of ketones. So if you're interested in how ketones might be beneficial for you, check out the Physiologic Flexibility Certification. It opens again on March 20th, 2023. It'll be open for one week. 
So if you want to learn how to use ketones as one of the approaches in the certification, the other ones are temperature changes, such as cold water immersion and sauna, pH changes, how you would go from like a zone two cardio to truly just absolutely brutal high intensity training, the fuel systems, which one end is gonna be ketones, the other end is gonna be a paradoxically a higher carbohydrate approach. When should you consider both of those? And then also regulation of oxygen and CO2. What are some techniques? Nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, aerobic training, and how is your body regulating oxygen and carbon dioxide? How can you leverage that to get true longevity increases and better performance as a side note, all while becoming more robust, resilient, slash anti-fragile in the process. So go to physiologicflexibility.com for all of the information there. A huge thanks to Dr. Stubbs for being on the podcast again. Make sure to check out her information below. She's always sharing some fun stuff from research. And thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I really appreciate it. Any feedback, please let me know. Leave us whatever stars you feel is appropriate or even a very short review. It goes a really long way to helping us get other guests and just better organic distribution of the podcast. As I mentioned right now, I'm the only person who sponsors this podcast. So the nice part is I can say whatever I want and then the income there is generated through the sale right now of the certifications. So if you want more information, check out physiologicflexibility.com before it opens next time. Thank you so much, greatly appreciate it. Talk to you next week. That was wonderful. Bravo. I loved that. Oh, it was great. Well, it was pretty good. Well, it wasn't bad. Well, there were parts of it that weren't very good, It though. could have been a lot better. I didn't really like it. It was pretty terrible. It was bad. It was awful. It was terrible. Get him away. Hey, boo. Boo.